x we're going to do what they call a logistics function now the logistics function is another type of function um, it's a little more complicated, but this is the parent logistics function. 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. Okay? And in the real world, what happens if we take that petri dish bacteria type of thing? Well, let me graph it and then I'll explain it. If we, uh, if we take the petri dish thing, uh, in other words, I take a bacteria, I put it in a petri dish, I let it grow, and I see what it does. At some point in time, what's going to happen to the bacteria living in the uh, petri dish? The, the bacteria will grow and grow and grow, but what happens eventually? Yeah, eventually the petri dish can only hold so many bacteria. So they'll either run out of food, because on that petri dish they put like a coating, which is like... It's, it's food, really, for the bacteria to grow. So they'll either eat up all the food or they'll grow to the point where no more bacteria can grow in um, the Petri dish. And so what we end up having is um, an exponential growth that eventually tapers off. And so the logistics model um, is a great way, and, and we have, we're going to do the parent version of it, the logistics model is a great way to make mathematical calculations uh, regarding that. And you'll see why in a second, as soon as I finish entering this uh, into the graph. So I've got one, two, three. There we go. I think I have enough. And so what happens is, is the bacteria starts to grow, and then it kind of tapers off. And I'm going to adjust my, my, my setting here. Um, we'll do like negative uh, three. To 10, actually, and then y we could do 0, 2, 2. And so this is what the logistics model kind of looks like. Over time, the bacteria will stop growing as much. And so what happens is even though the bacteria will kind of double, in other words, there might be one cell that grows enough to split into two, there are other cells that, for whatever reason, is either there isn't enough room in the petri dish uh, or they've run out of food, they die off. And so for every new bacteria uh, that's created, one dies off and it kind of levels off. This happens in nature, too. Um, if, if you go into a wooded area and there weren't any, there weren't any obstacles that caused... Uh, any hindrance on population growth of a certain type of squirrel, the squirrels would multiply and multiply and multiply, but eventually they'd run out of food. And when they ran out of food, then they could not sustain life. And so they would kind of plateau right here. Okay. Now the best way to model that, so this would be is like when, when they start to run out of resources. So in the real world, what we do, what we do in the real world is we go and we study ecological uh, systems and environments and try to make mathematical calculations. So with endangered species, this happens a lot. This is how species become endangered. Some, something in the environment changes which limits their population growth. And so if we can determine what's limiting their population growth, we could change that variable or parameter, and then hopefully over time they'll grow more. Okay, and so we do that. Um, we do mathematical modeling when we do that. However, in order to get it to fit our unique situations, we still have to transform the graph. Now, we can transform the graph uh, by doing a couple different things, and so I'm just going to jump into example number six. And example number six gives us this logistical equation. And it looks a little different. 1 plus 3 times times um, 0.7 raised to the x. Okay. 
And so what they want us to do is find the y-intercept and the horizontal asymptotes. And where that comes from is, is that if we look at the graph, if we look at the graph here, there's kind of like a horizontal asymptote where the graph doesn't get any bigger or any smaller. It's bounded from above and bounded from below, and those are the horizontal asymptotes. And then clearly it crosses the y-axis somewhere, right? So that's what they want us to do, except they want us to do it with uh, this equation here. Okay? Does that make sense? So the only thing I'm really going to do is I'm just going to graph that thing uh, and see what we come up with. So, and then we'll try to we'll work backwards and see if, we, if there's a way that we can come up with this information um, algebraically. So I'm going to have 1 plus... Three, oops, let's put that in parentheses on the bottom. 3 times 0.7 raised to the x. Now, I want to be uh, a stickler about this because um, I don't remember if it was this class or my second hour. If we don't enter it into the calculator correctly, sometimes the calculator will spit out the answer, but it's not the right answer. So if we put in the wrong information in the calculator, we'll get the wrong answer. All right? So one of the things with this is that I want to make sure that whenever I open a parentheses, that I close it. I have two opening parentheses, and I have two closing parentheses. All right? And then I want to make sure I can't just enter it in the calculator the way that I have it written down. So I'm going to graph both these, and so you can see the transformation. And actually, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Give that a second to finish graphing. And so we're going to do like negative 10 to 10. And then for the y values, I think they had 20 to 10. Now we'll just go up to 20. So we've got 10 and 20. And let's just do 0 here. So we'll graph it. So here's our original logistical equation, and then here's our transform logistical equation. So depending on how many of a species we begin with, you'll see that it starts to taper off. And that's okay. Now, how would I figure out what the vertical asymptotes are? Or, I'm sorry, the horizontal asymptotes. Does anybody know? Well, the way that we do this algebraically is we need to know that if I take this and I evaluate it at 0, f of 0 yields plus 0 .3, um, 3 times 0 0.7 raised to the 0 power. Now, remember that the y-intercept occurs when this thing has an x value of 0. So now what is 0.7 raised to the 0 power? 1. What's 1 times 3? Three? 3. What's 3 plus 1? 4. So I end up with 8 over 4, which is 2. So this is my y-intercept. Now, the asymptotes occur when we look at the end behavior. And I'm going to write those in red so you guys can see them a little better. So what I really want to do, or I'll write the first one in black. I want to figure out what happens to this function as it approaches infinity. Now, what that means is, is I'm going to take infinity and I'm going to plug it in here. Now, one way we could do that is we could plug in a really, really, really big number or a really, really, really small number. 
I'm going to plug in a really big number because we're looking at infinity. So if I take 0.7 and I raise that to 10,000, what happens at when 0.7 is raised to 10,000? Think of it like this. Um, on a little side note here, well, I don't want to do a side note. Let's just do it on the calculator. Um, if I say 0.7 raised to the second power, it becomes 0.49. So does it get bigger or smaller? This this number here, let's, let's double check and see if there's a pattern. Raised to the 3. If I say 0.7 raised to the 100, so what, what does that mean? Well, that means that this number approaches 0. 0 times 3 is 0, so it's really 8 over 1. What's 8 over 1? 8, right? So this is the first horizontal acetone. Now, for the next horizontal acetope, I want to do the exact same thing, but I want to consider the behavior of the graph as x approaches negative infinity. And so we're going to do the exact same thing, except now I'm going to put a very, very negative number in there. Okay? And so when I put a very, very negative number in there, um, in other words, if I say 0.7 raised to the negative 10, I get 35. Well, if I say 0.7 raised to the negative 1,000, oh, it's too big to fit in the calculator. So what happens here is that this starts to approach infinity. So we end up with 8 over infinity, sort of. And what's a constant over infinity equal? Zero. This is the second horizontal asymptote. And so what that means is, is if I come in here, and I'm going to turn that off. And I plug in y equals 0. Let me change the color of that. There, that'll work. And y equals 8. Those are my acetopes. And then what did I say the uh, intercept was? 2, right? So now let's graph it and see what we get. And I should probably zoom out. Ah, oh, you guys can see it, right? Let's zoom out just for the fun of it, though, so you get a, a better understanding of it. Okay, we'll graph it there. So the red line is the logistical equation that models some sort of growth that actually ends up having a decay at the end. Not a decay, but kind of more of a plateau, a leveling off. And algebraically, I was able to prove what the horizontal acetope, in other words, what bounds that from below and what bounds that from above, which is y equals 8 and y equals 0. And then mathematically, we know that the y-intercept occurs when x equals 0. So does anybody have any questions on that? Now, as I look out, I don't see a lot of graphs written on the paper, at least in the front row here. Do we, are we drawing these graphs? I don't see any calculators in your hands either. So when I go to do stuff on the calculator, you should have your calculators turned on and in your hands practicing this while I'm going over it with you. I realize we're not awake yet. It's the second day back from break. But we really should be trying and practicing these things. We don't want any surprises on test day. Okay? All right. No questions, though?